being here and worshiping. Thank you, God, for those who, who serve by uh, all that goes into bringing uh, the service together. And I, I uh, just thank you this morning for that. And pray now as we move into the time of the message that, God, you would just prepare our hearts uh, to hear the truth of your word. I pray that we would uh, remove the distractions, that, God, we would be able to hear clearly from you, and that, God, we would uh, hear your word with an open heart and an open mind that would be susceptible to the truth that would change us. And so, God, in whatever way you speak to us today, in whatever specific way each of us need to hear from you today, that, Lord, you would, uh, you would speak that truth into our lives. And that, God, we would be challenged by that, and, Lord, we would ultimately be changed by that. And so we uh, thank you, we look forward to that, and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. We are in the third week of our, our series on the radical ch Christian life, and we, uh, we've been looking at, at what it looks like to live in, in such a dramatic way that we are convincing to the rest of the world that Jesus has, is real, Jesus is alive, and Jesus has uh, actually stepped out of the grave. We looked at on Easter Sunday. We looked at the, uh, the, the, maybe the most convincing aspect of, of a resurrected Savior, and it was the, the lives that were changed so dramatically after they had encountered Jesus. And so, and so we, we specifically looked at Peter, and, and we looked at James, and, and Stephen, and Paul, and then that fifth person that we mentioned was you. It was us as Christians, uh, uh, that our radically changed life should be evidence of the resurrected Savior. And yet the, 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 uh, the question, maybe not the question, but the, the, uh, the concern that most people have in that regard is that they look at their own life and they don't see radical change. They don't see that it's that much different than it used to be. And, and so the wonder, when we wonder, am I, am I uh, a testimony to the risen Savior? Or is my life such that people wouldn't really put much credibility in the resurrection of Christ because my life doesn't look any different? And so we've looked at, uh, spent the last, this will be the third week, looking at the Sermon on the Mount and looking at what the radical, radically changed Christian life looks like. What, what Jesus challenged his disciples to. And, and when he sat down with them in the very beginning and said, said here, I want you to follow me, but he didn't, he didn't make it easy. He, made it, he, he laid it out there very clearly. This is going to be hard. This is going to be difficult. And then we started looking at that. Last week we looked at loving your enemies and the challenge of that. And this week we're going to move into another area that is maybe one of the, most, one of the favorite verses in, in Scripture today. And when I say favorite, it, it is maybe favorite in the sense that it's the most used. And it is the, the verse that has to do with judging others. Judge not lest ye be judged. It's become a real popular verse today in the world, and, and oftentimes not by Christians, that the world loves this verse. That those who don't know Jesus love the verse, judge not lest ye be judged. Because for them, it's a, it's a protection from us advocating our truth. It's a, it's a means of making sure that our truth doesn't encroach on their life or we don't try to make our truth encroach on their life. And then within the church, we use it kind of as a, a Teflon to our disobedience. And so when we act in a, in a way that's inappropriate as a Christian and somebody might come to us and point out, you know what, your, your actions don't line up with, with the cause of Christ, the, the, the description that Jesus gives us. And so we judge not lest ye be judged. And so it becomes a, a, a favorite of uh, sinners everywhere. And so what I want us to look at today is, is the importance of this verse and, and how we make sure that we, we don't fall into this judgmental attitude as believers. That we don't become the, the judgmental Christians that, that the world despises or that we as the church despise. And so we're going to look at, at that idea of judgmentalism today. And we're going to look at it. Remember, Jesus is talking about loving your enemies. He's gone through this description of difficult choices that we make in living the Christian life. And in the middle of that is this, this verse that has to do with judgment. Now, we usually focus only on the judging part, but there's actually four different elements that he speaks of in this particular, in this particular passage. Uh, but we're going to today kind of focus on the, judge, the judgment part. But here's what it says 
In Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 37, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured out into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so he describes four things. Now I want to kind of t- take these and kind of summarize them in, into, this, into this. Okay, he begins talking about judgment. And so he's talking about, here he's talking about grace, showing grace to other people. And then he goes there and he talks about condemning. And so now he's talking about mercy. And he goes from that into forgiveness, which I think we can pretty much say is forgiveness. And then finally he talks about generosity. And so four aspects of this that he's talking about, that we should be as Christians, we should be gracious, we should be merciful, we should, we should be forgiving, and we should be generous. Four things. But the thing that we really focus on usually when we get into this verse is judging. J- judge lest you, don't judge or you will be judged. And so, and, and we can see that he, he, he parallels them. He puts one against the other, ind- indicating there's a choice, there's an option. You can do this or you can do this. And so, uh, indicating that there is a, uh, and there's going to be a, a, there's going to be an outcome, there's going to be something that results as, uh, because you have done this. And so he goes on to say this in, in verse uh, 39. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit. The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. And so he uses a parable. Remember, now we usually separate this parable from the statement he made in the beginning, but they're together. And so indicating that the blind leading the blind has something to do with the judgment that we have on other people. And so then he goes on to to say this. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will clearly see, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So this whole thing has to do with grace and mercy and forgiveness and generosity. And this parable that he tells is is just an illustration of that truth. And so what I want us to think about today, and we're going to really focus on the judgmental part of it, is that this is a continuation of what it looks like to love in this world. This is a continuation of radical Christian living. And it's why this is hard. It's why this is difficult. Because this is, again, counterintuitive to human nature. This goes against what we would want to do or, or our, our normal tendency would be to do. And, and we can look at this, and we can, as I said in the beginning, we can use it outside the church to try to fend off those, those religious zealots that want to get into our life. Or we can use it within the church to get those who might want to point out the, the kind of the issues that I'm struggling with. And so it becomes this defense in all of those areas, in the church and outside the church. And so... Uh, we need to, to take a look at this and understand that, that when it comes to the judgment that Jesus is speaking of here, we need to begin with understanding what it's not. And it is not a, a, a description. Jesus is not presenting a model for church policy, but for personal responsibility. What I mean by that is this. Elsewhere in Scripture, it very clearly tells us that the church is given the responsibility of judging within the church. When someone, when someone falls away, when someone's leading, leading in disobedience, it's apparent to everybody that Paul indicates elsewhere in Scripture that we have a, a, a supreme important responsibility to maintain the purity of the church, to lead people to repentance. And so there is this responsibility that we have as a church to, to judge sin in the church. That's very clearly taught in Scripture. But what Jesus is pointing out here is that that isn't been, hasn't been given to you as an individual. That's not your responsibility as an individual. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have the opportunity to, to, be, to hold one another accountable, that, that lovingly guiding people to truth when they're beginning to stray away from the truth. There's certainly a, a, a part to play in that. But judgmentalism, as, as Jesus points out, is when we have our own issues, our own problems, and our own sin, which we are willing to overlook and yet, we will not look, overlook the sin in somebody else's life. 
And so we become judgmental. And, and we, we, we are viewing people in a, a kind of maybe in a lesser place in, in, in their relationship with God, in their relationship with, with people. And so we, we see Jesus teaching us this important truth about this. And it begins with this. And it is that the way that we treat others, according to Jesus in this, the way we treat others is going to impact the way that people treat us. And so if we show grace and if we show mercy, if we show forgiveness, if we show generosity, if that is what we live and demonstrate in our life, in a general purpose, in a general way, we are going to receive that back from other people. Now, I'm not, this isn't a prosperity gospel. This is just the truth that the way that we behave, the way we act, the way we treat others is going to affect the way people treat us. Now, that makes sense. We understand that. We, we are more likely to act gracious and merciful and generous towards somebody who's acting that way towards us. And so we begin with that understanding. Jesus teaches this to make it, make sure that you understand that if you want to be treated in this way, you're going to need to treat other people in that way. You need to behave and act as Jesus did. And when you do that, it's going to affect the way other people treat you. If you are harsh, unforgiving, judging, condemning, that is the way people are going to treat you. So, so the way that we treat other people is going to impact the way other people treat us. The second part of this is this. The way that we treat other people is going to impact the way God treats us. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm saying that, that forgiveness, if I can't forgive somebody, that I'm eternally separated from God. I don't believe that's what he's saying. But again, it's this general understanding that the way that we are treating other people, it, God is going to affect our relationship with God. And if you harbor, if you harbor unforgiveness in your heart, it is going to affect your relationship with God. I'm not talking about eternal separation if you are saved and you know Jesus, but it is going to affect your relationship with God. You are going to be separated from him in the sense that your fellowship with him is not what he would want and what you would want in your relationship. And so when we treat other people in that way, when we are judging and condemning, there is an impact on our spiritual relationship with, with, with God the Father. And so we, we enter into this understanding that. If we're going to be judging, if we're going to have a judgmental attitude, expect that your life with other people and your relationship with God is going to be impacted by that. It is going to be affected by, by that, that judgmental attitude that you might have. And so it is rooted in this, though. As we look at the, the parable that he tells, he talks of the man who has a plank in his eye, which is kind of terminology that we would not use or maybe understand. But the point is this, this guy's got a big problem with his vision. He's got something that's really a huge problem. And he's looking at a guy who's got a minor problem. And he's pointing out the flaw in his friend and ignoring the huge flaw in his own life, the huge problem that he has encountered. And here's the thing, judgmental, a judgmental attitude is rooted in this. It is an exalted view of your own righteousness. When you have an exalted view of your own righteousness, it will produce a judgmental attitude in your life. When you think that your goodness is more good, <laughs> your goodness is better than somebody else's goodness, then you're, you're going to become judgmental. If you enter into correcting a brother and you understand your own, you humbly come with your own flaws and your own recognizing your own weaknesses and, and, and you can approach that person without judgmental, being judgmental, you can approach that person with humility and gentleness that can restore them and bring them back. But when you enter into that, when you go to that person thinking that your goodness is superior to the goodness of your friend, you're in a bad place. You're, you're entering into a judgmental attitude. And so it begins with that. We, we need to understand that our goodness isn't good. Our goodness is only possible because of the righteousness of Christ that's in us. Apart from that, there is no goodness, is what the scripture says. And so, if we are going to be uh, able to, to fight off those tendencies to be, uh, to be judgmental, we need to understand that uh, we, our righteousness is really non-existent apart from Christ. And so, we begin with that. Then the second thing is this. A judgmental attitude is going to cloud your ability to give godly guidance to others. He indicates that you have this log in your eye, 
and you're trying to help somebody with a speck in his eye, and he, he, that leads into what? Blind leading the blind. Indicating that you're going to walk off the road. You're, you, are, you are not going to go where you think you're going. And so when we have this, this sin, this problem in our own life that we haven't dealt with, which has resulted in this judgmental attitude towards others, and we try to speak truth into their life, it's going to be without value. It's going to be pointless. It's going to come across as judgmental. It's going to come across as, as, as uh, superior. And, and, so, and so if we are going to be able to combat this tendency to be judgmental, we need to, to understand that our ability to help other people is only possible when we examine the, the problems in our own life, our own vision. And so the sin in your life, the sin in your life is going to cloud your ability to give guidance to somebody else. Judgmental attitude will not lead you to restoring another believer. In fact, if you want to check your judgmental attitude, if you want to, you want to see maybe a, a kind of a simple test of whether or not you're judgmental or not, think about what you desire in an outcome. As you, as you encounter somebody within the church who is, who is disobedient, who's being sinful, who has treated you in a, in, in a, in a wrong way, you want to find out, check your heart, ask what do you, what's your desired outcome. What would you like to see happen as a result of this? If, if, if you, what you want is you want them thrown out of the church, then you're being judgmental. If what you want is restoration, if you want, them, you want them restored to Jesus, if you want to see repentance in their life, if that's what your heart is, then, then that's probably not a judgmental attitude. Judgment seeks condemnation. It desires punishment as opposed to restoration. And so as we, as, as, as Christians, as we, we desire, as we lead to, uh, or, or want to correct other b believers, make sure that our motives truly desire to do that. And when we are able to, uh, when, when we are able to, uh, my, um, technology, So when we have a judgmental attitude, it's going to cloud our ability to, to offer guidance to others. So, so what do we do then when we find ourselves heading in that direction? When we find ourselves uh, being judgmental, how do we correct that? Well, the first thing we need to do is this. We, we need to choose not to assign the worst intentions on others. I have this tendency in my life, when, when somebody wrongs me, to, make the, to, to assume that you meant to wrong me that you intended to harm me, that you were intentionally attempting to do something harmful to me. And, and, and that occurs in other areas of my life. Yesterday, we drove up to Clark Summit to pick up Danny. Three and a half hours one way, three and a half hours the other way. And so I encountered a lot of aggravating drivers on the road, right? In fact, my kids know that when I encounter those drivers on the road, they are clowns. That's the word that I've used for years. The clowns. Look, look at these clowns, right? And, 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 so I, and so I get angry at the clowns on the road. And clowns on the road are ones that drive 55 in the passing lane, right? P people that are inconsistent in their speed, up and down, back and forth. People that go around you and then slow down. I mean, the, the cruise control is there for a reason. Use it. <laughs> 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 or, or this is one of my favorites, the, 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 the tractor and trailer driver that decides to pass his buddy on a hill. You can't do it! <laughs> and, so I've, and so I've used that with my kids for life. I said, look at these clowns! And, and, I, and I, I signed the worst intentions on them. They are doing this just to aggravate me. I, I, I finally kind of came with my kids, I kind of came to a, a, a little bit of a resolution with this years later. I got to thinking about these clowns driving. I said, you know what, they're trying to drive and they got them big floppy shoes on. I mean, <laughs> that, that would be challenging. But I, but I assume I, I put intentions on them. I assume they're doing something intentionally. 
and, and, and Teresa, yesterday, yesterday where a guy comes up alongside me. I'm, I'm coming up on somebody, so I'm just about to, and I, and I can't hit the brakes because I have to keep my cruise control on. Okay, that's the game. So I'm moving up on the guy, getting ready to pass. Here comes a guy up, gets right beside me, and just slows down to my speed. I've got to hit my brakes, okay? So it's over at that point. And I immediately go into a rant, and Teresa's like, okay, there's a guy like two cars up that slowed down. He had to do that. And so I, I'm assigning my, the, the worst intentions on him. They're doing this on purpose, and yet there's extenuating circumstances. There's things that I don't know about, and that's true about other things in our life. And oftentimes, what you think, someone who said that is, you think they are intentionally attempting to hurt you, it was just kind of careless. It, it was just kind of thoughtless, and yet, and yet we assume the worst from them. There's a, a quote on your bulletin today, uh, and it's called Hanlon's Razor. And he says this, never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. And, and, and what he's saying in a kind of a harsh way is that we immediately want to assume that somebody wants to hurt us, or is doing something intentionally to harm us, when, when in all likelihood it's just probably just oversight or thoughtlessness. Napoleon said something actually similar. He's, he said, never ascribe to never ascribe to malice that which is better explained by incompetence. <laughs> He's saying that oftentimes that which you think somebody's out to get you isn't that at all. It's just somebody kind of not thinking their actions through. And so if we become judgmental, we tend to look at everything that somebody does and it becomes personal and it's aimed at me and it's intended to hurt me and we need to kind of back off from that and give people grace and mercy that maybe, maybe they're just having a bad day. Maybe, I, I don't know the whole picture. You know, one of the things that really impacted me with the whole driving thing was, was when, my, when my daughter started driving. I, I could be very short with people on the road. And you know, I started thinking, you know what, that might be like somebody's 16-year-old who's just learning to drive. And it, and it changes the way that I think of, of, of other people. And so understanding that when it comes to when we are confronted with kind of difficult and harmful people and people that we might want to judge right away, don't ascribe the worst to them. Give them the benefit of the doubt. They may, may not be near as, uh, it, not be any malice intended in what they're doing. We also correct a judgmental attitude by honestly examining ourselves. This really becomes kind of the key to getting rid of judgment because when we begin to look at ourselves, when we're judging someone else, somebody else, we take a moment and we look at ourselves, we begin to realize how much worthy we are of judgment in, in, in truth. That, that when it comes down to it, if, if God were truly judging based on my merit, I deserve to be judged. And so we begin to examine our own life and our own heart. We, we, are, we know ourselves more than anybody. And when I sit down, I begin to look at myself and compare what I know about myself to what I know about you. Believe me, I got more problems than you do. From my perspective, what I know about me is uglier than anything I know about you. And so, and so when we begin to look at our life in that way, it begins to kind of temper that desire, that need to judge other people because we begin to see ourselves for who we really are. And we're not near as likely to look down on somebody else for who they are. And so we make sure that we examine ourselves honestly. And then it comes down to this, and it is necessary, is that we correct a, a, a judgmental attitude through humble repentance. When we get to that place where we recognize our own failings, then we repent of that. We, we humble ourselves. And when we do that, we're able to begin to see people in, 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 in their problems and their issues in a, in a way that seeks restoration, not simply judgment or punishment or, or inflicting pain on them. And so it is through humble repentance. But I will say this, the other side of that too. For some people, you, you've experienced what you think is the judgment of other people. And maybe it isn't judgment. Maybe it is somebody who's showing you love and, and correction, as, as the Bible has indicated. Somebody that, that sees where your sin's leading you, and they're, they're trying to help you. They're trying to guide you into the truth. And all you're saying is, you're judging me. For you, you need humble repentance too. 
to be able to hear and receive the, the truth that God wants you to hear and respond to. So the answer, whether you are a judging person or you are a person who feels like you've been judged, the answer is humble repentance. It is, it is falling before God, repenting of those inconsistent, sinful ideas in our heart and allowing the truth to either emerge from us or allowing us to receive the truth as God intends. And so as, as Christians, one of the most, I think, difficult and challenging things in the church is that idea of, of correction, of, 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 of judgment. And, and, and yet God has given us a very clear picture that it, there's a place in the church. There's a need to be able to, to, to divide, to, to divine, to, to separate that from which is incorrect in judging from that which is. And so wherever that is in your life today, that, that God would work in you and guide you in that truth and, and lead us to receive humbly correction that's needed and lead us to gently be able to, to, to provide guidance for in those areas in somebody else's life that's needed. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And this challenging part of the text, God, where again, Jesus calls out these, these things that just aren't, aren't easy for us. Ways of living and actions that, that, that fly in the face of normal human behavior. And I pray, God, that we would be able to receive this truth and act in an appropriate way. For those of us, Lord, that today tend to be a little judgmental, that, that tend to look down on others, who bear a critical eye in so many areas. God, we repent of that. We, we just ask for your forgiveness and help us, Lord, to, to see other people not as somehow less than us, but see them as, 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 as broken and lost people who need restored. God, for those of us who are on the other side and and, and, and are pointing a finger and saying and accusing people of being judgmental every time they, they try to offer insight and truth into our life, I pray, Lord, that we would humbly receive that, that we would receive the, the truth of your word in a way that would allow us to be changed, wouldn't, wouldn't fight against those who truly care about us and, and, and want us to be restored to you. So, Lord, wherever that might be, I, I, I can't imagine that there's not one person here today that doesn't fall on one side or the other of that. God, just work in our lives. Change us. Allow us to be the, the, the loving, radically changed believers that you want us to be. We thank you and we pray these things all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand up?